Ah, wait. This is fun. This is fun figuring this out. <laughs> it shows live on my top of my screen, so I think we might be live. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, I think we're live. Let me double check. Be real awkward if we're not. <laughs> I can see it on our Facebook. Are we live? I think so. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. Oh my god. Yeah, we're live. We're live. We're good. Okay. Thank you everyone for dealing with that awkward uh, transition to our Facebook Live. We're going to be so good at this next time. I promise. We promise. We'll be much better. Uh, this is the first time to do this. So, uh, All right, we are live. Hey. Yeah, we're great. We're great. Hi, my name is Sarah Beth Wilson, and I'm Director of Exhibitions and Curatorial Projects at Art League Houston, and this is my colleague. Hi, I'm Erin Cardi. I'm really bad tech support, but I am the Communications and Program Associate at Art League Houston. And Erin is lying about the tech support. She literally <laughs> like figures everything out for us, so she's great. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us today. We are going to switch gears in a few minutes and talk about our exhibitions and hopefully give y'all a virtual walkthrough of the shows. But before we do that, we wanted to share just a little bit about Art League's open call and exhibition process and a little bit about what we do. So uh, before we get started with that, I thought Erin could share some background on what the Blue Tape Art Talks are and what they'll look like going forward. Yeah, so the Blue Tape Art Talks was like a little project conceived between me and Sarah as a way to kind of give more background information and just like behind the scenes info about our exhibitions that people may not necessarily get during our artist talks or during openings. So initially it was supposed to be in person, but due to unfortunate circumstances with COVID-19, we're all working remotely, we're having it digitally. Uh, we're hoping to have a talk with every exhibition that we have in the future, and hopefully those will be in person, but as you can see, we can always work digitally if needed. Yeah, so just we'll keep you updated if you follow Art League on social media, our website, calendar, everything there, we'll mention when we're having these. And these will be in addition to artist talks. We're still 100% for sure keeping our artist talks the weekend of the opening reception. Uh, this is just going to be a supplemental kind of very casual informal walkthrough that Aaron and I will conduct per round of shows. Uh, so yeah, so just to tell you a little bit about what I do um, as director of exhibitions, I work with all of our artists to kind of plan and execute their exhibition. So especially if it's coming from the open call process, uh, they've already created an idea for a show. And we're actually going to see a mix today of exhibitions that were selected via open call and then one that's a curatorial project. So those that are the open call, uh, they have proposed an idea and then I communicate and work with them on how to bring that to Art League. I mean, because every space is a little different. So we'll work on the planning and the number of works involved and everything like that. Artists come in for the install most of the time. So in this case, uh, all of the artists actually that we'll look at today came in for their install. And our open call is actually up right now. I'm gonna share with y'all real quick uh, where to find the open call. Can y'all see my home screen okay? Okay, so this is the Art League website. Uh, this is just if you went to our home screen. So if you wanna find information about our open call because you wanna submit a proposal, you go to exhibitions and then the drop down and you'll select exhibition open call. And everything you need to know is right here. Everything from our mission to how long the open call is gonna be up, when the shows will be programmed. This might shift a little bit later. We're still kind of working on some postponements due to COVID-19, but I'll update that once I know for sure. But the shows will definitely be in the 2022, early 2023 year. My email address is there. I mean, I'm happy to meet with you or schedule phone meetings if you have any questions and pretty much all the info about the space, stipends, review criteria, and links to submittable. So please take a look uh, and let us know if you have any questions. Erin knows a lot about this as well. So, and Erin, why don't you tell them a little bit about what you do too? 
Yeah, so I'm the communications and program associate. So if you see a social media post, it's something more than likely I created, especially the little art history essays, as I like to call them. Um, I also help out with programming. So I'll help out with exhibitions for install and deinstall. I help out with registration for the school. And then wherever Epi needs me for community, I'm always there to help. And one thing about the open call process is it's open to anyone. So it's not just Houston based. You can be out of town and still apply. Yes, it's international even. So please do take a look and share with any colleagues. Um, we love to see proposals come in from all over. Um, and thank you, Erin, for all of your hard work. I mean, Erin helps a lot during our installs and exhibition process. And as I like to say, she is the glue, or in this case, the blue tape that holds her together. So uh, we, we haven't rehearsed that one. Uh, and then curatorial projects. So real quick, curatorial projects are basically what they sound like. They are exhibitions that happen at Art League that I have curated and organized independently of the open call. So starting in November, actually, we will have every round, there'll be open call selections, but then one curatorial project per round. So that's an artist or an exhibition that I've conceived of. And we'll look at one of those today. Actually, the first um, exhibition we'll be looking at was a curatorial project. So there'll kind of be a mix of those going forward. But please uh, let us know if you have questions. Erin knows a lot about the open call too. So she's happy to share more. We always want to answer questions and help whenever we can. We have an artist advisory board that reviews the applications and makes the selections. And Philip Pyle, an artist here in Houston that many of you probably know is going to be our chair for the next artist advisory board. So we're looking forward to working with Philip on that. Uh, okay, so let me uh, go ahead and get started here with our first exhibition we'll be looking at. Uh, this is Where We Are, which was a curatorial project um, that I kind of began working on late last year. And thinking about PhotoFest, I was wanting to show an exhibition of work by emerging artists all working with photography in some way. So that's kind of where this exhibition was conceived from. And I emailed colleagues in the field around Houston, just said, are there any emerging artists working with photography uh, that you would recommend I look at? And I got some great feedback and uh, many of them kind of messaged me and said, hey, you should take a look at these artists. And there were three that stood out to me, Michaela Kadungal, Veronica Guyana, and Jamie Robertson, because I, I loved their work and what they were doing, their practice, but also really enjoyed uh, the fact that they use their body in interesting ways. And that's kind of where this exhibition focus came from, was looking at how all three of these artists use their body in their work and in their creative practice. So we're gonna talk specifically about each artist with a little bit of bio background and a little bit on their work too. And what you're seeing right now are just install shots. We have Veronica's pieces in the white frames here. You can see Michaela's cyanotypes on quilts in the background, and then Jamie's work in the niche over here. And we'll, I'm gonna kind of scroll through here where we can get a few more close-ups let you see the exhibition. And it, you can see it's in the hallway space. So you can see the main gallery down the hall there. So to start off, uh, Michaela Kadungog was one of the artists selected. And Michaela is a multidisciplinary artist whose work really looks at dissecting dualities of the female body, shame and sexualization, separation of physical and emotional self. I mean, she's dealing with lots of different stuff in her work. She draws primarily from personal experiences, traces the history of intimacy and emotional impact through her pieces. Michaela has her BFA from U of H in the photography and digital media department. And she exhibited in 2019 at Flatgen, Flatland Gallery and was also in the um, Project Row House Summer Studios program in 2019. And Erin, do you wanna share a little bit more about Michaela's work? Yeah, so Michaela created these cyanotype quilts so cyanotype is a process in which you use sun exposure and something on top of your paper or material to create an imprint. And so she created these really anthrop anthropomorphic body type sculptures out of quilts. And she's really thinking about the female body and the violence that kind of encompasses the female body, but also the tenderness that's there. So you have things like sex and menstruation and pregnancy really can be violent acts coupled with tenderness, like a having a child or actually having a very intimate moment with your partner. So she's kind of looking at those ideas. And then the really nice thing about 
what she did with the stereotypes is like how she created them. So creating a quilt is a very violent act in itself to create something that becomes ultimately very comforting. So with the quilt, you're repeatedly stabbing the fabric with the needle, but in the end, you have something that comforts you. So it's really this nice duality between femininity and violence. And I really, I really like the work. I really love seeing photography in a medium that can be taken outside of just the traditional frame context too as well. Actually, and Erin, sometimes seeing photography used in different ways with different media helps me understand the process more. Uh, just because like, it's uh, photography has always been a little scary to me because there's so many different ways uh, it can be used. And so I think it's really beautiful and inspiring to see artists branching out and doing different work. Uh, so we're gonna move ahead and talk about Jamie Robertson for a moment. Uh, Jamie is a visual artist and educator from Houston. She received her BA in art from U of H and her MS in art therapy from Florida State University. Jamie's interested in cultural community development through creative youth development. And her creative practice involves autobiographical examination of history and identity in the African diaspora through photography, printmaking, and sculpture. So Jamie's also one of those that is kind of pushing the boundaries, not just creating uh, photographs, but also digital work, sculpture. I mean, she's doing lots of different things. Also, congrats, Jamie. Congratulations. We're so for you. She's graduating now uh, from her, the MFA Studio Art Program. She's concentrating in photography and digital media from U of H. So everyone, give a shout out to Jamie. We're very proud of her. And Erin, do you want to share a little bit more about the work we're seeing? Yes, yeah, so for the portraits, Jamie was drawing from a historical context, so looking at traditional historical portraiture, but she was also looking at women of color, specifically Black women, and how they are presented throughout history. She was drawing her inspiration for her portraits from these photos and paintings and album covers like Donna Summers, and seeing how they were treated, but also we don't know if those women back then had control over if they were painted or not, or if they were like, I'm gonna get painted or if they were forced to be painted. So by having Jamie be both in front and behind the camera, she's taking control over her own agency and basically making the name and giving herself her own agency and her own control. And then she also is trying to find common threads throughout the African diaspora. So whether through its historical context with portraiture or as shown in her video, Flat Red, through music and dance. So her video, Flat Red, has is a video of her dancing different types of styles, like bachata from uh, the, where is it? Bachata from the Dominican Republic, or Cupte de Cal from the Ivory Coast. And she's really trying to find that unifying common thread through dance with the African diaspora. And it's a really great video. Hopefully you guys can see it in person. It has really great music to it, but it's just really finding the commonality through the thread of the African diaspora and really bringing that history out and taking control over your history, I think would be a really great way to describe it. I love too when you walk through the hall and you can like hear the video and the beats uh, going as you're looking at the exhibition, like it really kind of livens the space and I, I hope everyone gets to experience that soon. Yeah. Uh, okay, so our final artist to look at is Veronica Guyana, who uh, was born in 1994 in Brownsville, Texas visual artist and educator living and working in Houston, but also splitting her time in Mexico. She frequently travels back to Mexico, visiting family and conducting site-specific research for her creative practice there. Veronica is really interested in looking at issues of identity, the current political climate, and her work explores notions of situation, loss, and migration through her location-driven research that happens on the borderlands between Texas and Mexico. In 2019, she traveled to Marfa, Texas, and France to take part in the Dust Residency, and she's also at U of H right now, currently working on her MFA in studio art in the photography and digital media department. She's a second year, so yeah. she'll be going into her third and final year next year, and uh, you're, you're seeing, I'll, I'll scroll back a little bit, but you're seeing uh, there's Veronica and then her eight photographs here um, that are all recent works, a recent body that she's been working on looking at this area um, on the Texas and Mexico border. And I'll, I'll let Erin tell a little bit more about that. Yeah, she's focusing on the idea of a remittance landscape, which is what I understand the absence of a presence in rural Mexico. And she's also trying to reconnect her family there. So you see a lot of dilapidated buildings and broken down and she's just trying to symbolize like reconnect your family from where they are, from where they came from to where they are now, but also thinking about translados, which is where you 
bring family members who are in the United States, but wish to be born or wish to be buried in Mexico. So it's kind of getting rid of the idea of a border because it's just kind of like this constant movement between the two. And there's still that sense of ownership and that sense of place by being living in the United States, being buried in Mexico, there's no such thing as a border. This is your place, this is your ownership. And I think that's a really great thing as someone, because I grew up in El Paso, so kind of seeing that type of movement between the two, it kind of disregards borders and fences and anything like that. And then one thing I really, really enjoy about her photographs is that they're printed on velvet. So velvet looks kind of almost like watercolor paper. It's not glossy, it's not matte, it's not luster. It just, it creates this really beautiful texture, but also allows the ink to bleed, kind of almost making it painterly. And it really highlights her interest in the dilapidated buildings, these broken down cement, these really muted colors. I think it just brings her photographs to life. Like it's one of my favorite parts about it. And this is one of my favorite things about working with Erin because I, I come from an art history background. And I, I mean, I've taken some art classes in relation to art history, but not a fine arts background, art history with my masters and such. And Erin has that art background and she's frequently pointing things out with her artist's eye, uh, like this paper that I maybe didn't notice. I mean, I was looking at the subject and then, I mean, it is, it's just beautiful. It's, it's stunning the way it uh, plays across the page. And I, I had, would have never noticed that. Thank you, Erin. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, so let me see. We're gonna go on now. That's our hallway show. And I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but please be sure to go to our website. You can check out uh, video interviews with all of the artists where you actually get to hear them speak about their work and their words when they were here for their opening reception. And those are by Ronald Llewellyn Jones. So if you go to our, up, our on view page of the website, you'll see links to each video. And we encourage you to go do that. Uh, next up, we're going to switch gears and talk about our main gallery exhibition, and this is The Writing on the Wall by Alice Leora Briggs and Julian Cardona. And this exhibition is different from the hallway in that it was part of our open call. So Alice actually proposed this body of work to be exhibited at Art League Houston, and it was selected by the Artist Advisory Board for exhibition. Uh, Alice currently lives in Tucson, Arizona, but her home base is really in Lubbock. She's been a longtime resident of Texas and still goes back there frequently. She received her MA and MFA from the University of Iowa. She's had numerous fellowships and residencies, and she's a past Fulbright scholar, but we also are super excited for Alice that she just found out like last week that she's a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow. So congrats, Alice. Yay! We're very excited for you. That's a huge deal. And the body of work that we're looking at right here, so you're seeing install shots of the main gallery, is kind of a collaborative project uh, between Alice and a Juarez reporter and photojournalist Julian Cardona, where they've been working to write and illuminate an unhinged graphic glossary of the language of violence in Juarez. So they've both been working on the written text for the book, it's a book project, right, Erin? That's gonna be- Yeah, it's an upcoming book project. Yeah, so um, we'll keep everyone posted once more. And these are actually portraits of Julian by Alice. Uh, but the book will eventually come out. They've both been working on the text together, but all the art, all the objects you're seeing on view in the gallery here are by Alice. So she's the creator of these pieces. And uh, the, what you're seeing here, the technique is actually the sgraffito process. So all of the work is sgraffito, which is an Italian word. that's literally like you're, you're cutting into a board and exposing a white background. So it's kind of a process of uh, positive negative that happens to create the work. And some pieces like this piece right here actually has paint applied with the sgraffito. And that's where the yellow text coming through, um, same here. So all the work is sgraffito based in this show. And Erin, do you wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about the exhibition? Yeah, so if you've noticed, our past two rounds in our main gallery have been very installation based, like with Binyan Aesthetic, we have the really beautiful giant pinata mural with Taja Lindley, the entire room was transformed with the black plastic trash bags. But for this show, it was very much more museum based, very museum heavy. We make sure things were aligned on the wall and it was everything was at eye level. But another interesting thing is we painted the walls like this neutral tan color and then everything just kind of completely pops because of that. Like you really see the contrast in the colors mm -hmm. and with the marks and the texture. For sure. And we actually have uh, a few works we wanna, so I'm gonna 
bear with me. Let's see, I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint here. We have a few works we wanna speak about in more detail here. Uh, so Erin, if you wanna go ahead here. So this is kind of like part of a diptych and it's called El Chapulain or the Grasshopper. And so that Chapulain translates to Grasshopper, but it also refers to someone who switches loyalty whenever it's really convenient for them. And Alice is trying to show that as a symbol of how the Mexican government is really corrupt and people will just switch parties whenever it's really convenient for them. And this kind of glossary is something that we also see in another piece called ABC Dario de Juárez, which is a list of all the letters of the Spanish alphabet. And each letter has like a corresponding glossary term with it, which will be found in the upcoming book with Cardona and Alice. But and here, actually, this is a right here. If y'all can see where my cursor is, this is another portrait of Julian. And Erin, I forget what you said yesterday, but when we were talking, kind of prepping for today, um, you mentioned the importance of the fact that they're building this vocabulary. And it, we kind of got on this discussion of how when dealing with something, at least for me, when I'm looking at this body of work, the first stage or one of the stages in understanding and trying to address the problems there is putting a name to something right. and acknowledging that it's happening. The fact that the government was not acknowledging this at all and this violence is just existing and giving people a language and a way to understand and try to move past this. And I think it's really important work that Alice and Julian have been doing um, through this body of work. And I, I think that's a really big step in moving past this period of corruption that they were yeah. seeing. Uh, I do want to say really quickly to this piece, along with some other works in the exhibition, and one we'll talk about more specifically in a moment, our own loan from the TIA collection in Santa Fe. And we're extremely grateful to them for being lenders to our exhibition and working with us on the show. So thank you so much. Uh, and then the last supper, this is also on loan from the TIA collection. Erin's going to share a little bit more about this piece. Yeah, so all the figures seen in this piece are someone that Alice knows personally and loves and admires. So her parents, her husband, her daughter, the artist Jane Abrams, and then Julian Cardona is also in this piece. And I think there's another photo. Yeah, Sorry. real quick before we move to that photo, just so you can be sure we can see what's happening. Are these? This is actually six different panels. So yeah. it's divided into compartments up here, but one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're all very large. And this is a mix of that scraffito and painting technique. And then yeah. here's a detail of this bottom panel right here with Alice's daughter and then Julian Cardona here. Yeah. And then there's a phrase in the painting that you guys could see in the previous slide. And that says, flying in, comparing our moment on earth with a time to which we have no knowledge, flying in through one window and swiftly out another, a sparrow disappears back into the storm. And that phrase is adapted from Venerable Bede's Parable of the Sparrow. And it just reminds us that we're only here for a limited amount of time and a lot of things happen and we can't control it and it's out of our control. And it just, we kind of just have to keep going forward with what we have right now. And so a kind of really poignant phrase for right now. No. right now, yeah. And when you all get to see this in person, I just encourage you to get up close and look at the line and the texture that's made from the cross hatching and line use. Uh, it, it's amazing. I mean, this is the work uh, is unparalleled in the artistic skill here. Um, also, I wanted to sh give a shout out to Alice's gallery in Santa Fe of Vogue Contemporary, who also loaned quite a bit of the work in the exhibition. So we're appreciative of both the TIA collection and Evoke Contemporary, as well as our paint sponsor, Valspar Paint, for donating our paint that was used on the wall. So thank you so much to all of our exhibition underwriters and donors that help make exhibitions like this possible. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about our final exhibition, Hatsubon by Tomiko Jones, that's on view in our front gallery. And similar to Alice, we've got a, a slideshow that'll play, but then we've got a few images we wanna speak out about specifically as well. Uh, so this exhibition by Tomiko is also part of our open call and it is presented in conjunction with PhotoFest 2020. So please be sure to go to PhotoFest website. I know they've been trying to do a lot of digital programming too, and you'll find information about shows all over in the Houston region that were in conjunction uh, with PhotoFest and Tomiko is one of them. Uh, Tomiko applied to our open call and this was selected by the artist advisory board. 
Tamiko is not based here in Texas. Uh, Tamiko is actually based in Madison, Wisconsin, where she served as assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So I know Tamiko has been really busy lately getting all of her classes online and working hard up there. She's got her MFA in photography with a certificate in museum studies from the University of Arizona in Tucson. Much of Tamiko's work and what you're seeing here, and Aaron's gonna share more in a moment, is linked to place and explores transitions in the landscape through social, cultural, and geographical terms. Water is pretty much always present in her work and it's present you know, mentally just in her philosophy um, as sites of cultural practice, economic imperative, and a locus of spiritual belief. So water is extremely poignant in the body of work we're looking at here too. Um, so Tamiko came in for the install. She was extremely busy during that time because she was also here for the SPE conference. She serves on the board of directors for the Society for Photographic Education. And it was it was great to get to work with her on the install. And I mean, that's one of the kind of cool things, Erin. I don't know, if you, but I love getting to be in the galleries. Yeah, I like being, doing install because you get to learn about little things that you may not get to hear in an artist talk. You just get to really be with the work and find like a little discoveries and stuff like that. It's really, really fun. Exactly. And get to kind of, you learn different things about the pieces, but also about the artist's mentality to like how they want their work presented and installed and why. And I think that's a really important but fun aspect of our job that we get to do. Um, so Aaron, do you want to share a little bit more about Hatsuban and what we're looking at here? Yeah, so Hatsuban is actually a memorial to Tamiko's father. He passed away. And this also kind of highlights family ties, but also cultural ceremonies and traditions. And as Sarah mentioned that there's a really deep sense of place here. So there are three specific places that Hatsuban focuses on. The first is in Pennsylvania. I'm not going to pronounce the river because I'm going to butcher it, but it's outside of Pittsburgh and it's the river where Tamiko's father grew up in playing. So there are some photos where you see his urn out in the river. And then I think it's a the Monongahela River in Swissvale. Yeah. Mana the Gila River, yeah. Yeah, that's about. <laughs> and then another place is California. And that also involves the idea of water at a tidal basin. But California is where Tamika was born, but also where her parents met. So there's another family tie there. And the final place is Hawaii, where Tamika's mother was born. And that's where the actual process and ceremony of Obon took place. And Obon is a Japanese Buddhist ceremony, similar to Dia de los Muertos, where you honor your ancestors and invite them to come celebrate with you. And those are what you see in our silk pieces, but there's also the where she released the boat or the Shoryo Bune, and that's where she released her father's ashes out to sea. So her father still resides or still is that's present. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in this exhibition, you're looking at a mix of two dimensional work hanging on the wall, uh, framed in walnut frames, which Aaron and I, I believe we were saying is one of her father's uh, favorite nuts, actually. So yeah. it's extremely purposeful, like why Tamiko selected that wood specifically. And then he says, uh, photographs printed on silk. So it's really beautiful and you're probably catching, and we've got a couple more photos we'll look at in a second where you can kind of feel that movement that happens throughout the space. Uh, also, there's an oar, which you probably notice in some of the photographs or, that are rotating through, a sculptural piece suspended in the exhibition. And that is actually part of a larger piece that includes a boat too, but we did not include the boat in our show. But Tomiko created that to go in conjunction with this body of work. And I love the fact that here we have an artist uh, working with photography, but also sculpture and installation base. I mean, it's really uh, mixed media in that sense and really all encompassing. And the printing on silk is just stunning. Um, I, you've got to be able to experience it in person to really get the full movement that's happening there. And Erin, I'm going to go ahead and let me see if I can find one more of the or to show everyone that there we go. Yeah, uh, we're just spending there in the space. And then I'm going to go ahead. We have some works to kind of talk about more specifically that I want to share. So here's a great photo. And our photos here are by Alex Barber, who does a great job. And thank you, Alex, for your work on these. But I love how the piece here is moving. Yeah. And you really get a sense of the motion of just even when you walk through the space. 
And Aaron mentioned um, the kind of performance ritual that was happening here. And another thing that's pretty cool to know is that Tamiko, I mean, she of course asked her family if it was okay to film and video the, these things happening, but they created their own um, clothes and wear their own kimonos and everything for this. And so really, I mean, there's even the aspect of performance that comes in um, into play. And I love the way the silk pieces move. Like since so many of these photographs involve water, they kind of almost mimic water when like the wind hits them or the AC unit hits them. They just float really gently in midair and it's really, really beautiful. Yeah, it's a stunning presentation. And this is actually a self-portrait of the artist there. And then one thing I really remember when we were installing that struck me and was really important was Tamika was uh, focusing on this installation right over here of the five small photographs. It's this reliquary installation. And she really wanted to make, I mean, those of you familiar with our front gallery know it's, it's just one big space but she wanted to be able to make kind of a, a niche where those works could be experienced as part of the greater whole, but also have their own kind of quiet space. And so it was kind of a, a curatorial uh, decision, but in installing this banner here and then the silk banner over here, we made kind of a sacred room um, to come and look at these works. So you can see these pieces more up close here. And these are the same walnut frames that we were discussing earlier, but images of her father during the final days and um, extremely tender and intimate images as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. That might be it. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and listening to our talk. And sorry for the snafus going live. I think we were live that entire time, Erin. <laughs> we were like, is, are we live? Uh, <laughs> But please be sure to go to our website. There are artist interviews up. So you can hear Tamiko in the space discussing her work and that body of work specifically. Same with Alice and the hallway gallery artists. So check those out. We're working hard to bring more programming over the coming days. So uh, we look forward to offering more and hopefully seeing everyone in person at some point in the near future. These are excellent shows and we hope that you're able to come and check them out soon. So yeah. thank you and thank you, Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for everyone who tuned in. Thank you guys so much. All right. We're going to end the meeting.